Hey, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first Eberly Science Exchange, a series of lunch talks presented by the faculty in the Eberly College of Science. I'm Donald Schneider, the head of the Department of Astronomy. Today's speaker is Professor Jason Wright, who will discuss Penn State's search for intelligent life in the universe. Professor Wright joined Penn State in 2009. In 2019, he was awarded the prestigious Drake Prize for outstanding contributions to the field, and he is the director of the newly formed Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center. Following the presentation, Professor Wright will be available to answer questions. If you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button that is located in the icon bar in your Zoom screen and type your question into the window. Remember to hit the return key to submit your question. You can enter your questions at any time. Professor Wright. All right, thanks, Don. And I will activate my talk here. Okay, Don, I'll trust you'll tell me if this isn't working in some way. So I'm really uh, excited to give this talk and talk about um, what we're doing at the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center. Um, you know, it's, it's funny when most uh, scientists, professional scientists, say in the biology department or mathematics or chemistry, if they're on a plane and the person in the next seat asks them what they work on, the honest answer is usually really esoteric. It's going to be something that, you know, you would need a master's degree to understand just, you know, what the answer was. And so they'll have to find some distant connection to something applied that, uh, that they can say, you know, oh, it's connected to how we make latex or something like that. But when I'm asked what I do, uh, on a plane or something. And I say, well, I look for signs of intelligent life in the universe. It's great because, you know, everyone knows what that means and they're really excited about it. So it's really cool to work on a topic that has such popular resonance. And I feel, you know, really lucky to be able to do this. And that popular resonance goes back a really long way. Um, I like to show this quote from uh, Albert the Great, one of the fathers of the Catholic Church who asked, do there exist many worlds or is there but a single world? This is one of the most noble and exalted questions in the study of nature. Now, Albert was actually thinking about metaphysical questions like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin and that sort of a thing. He wasn't really thinking about alien life on other planets, but those of us in the biz like to show this, uh, like to show this quote because it makes us feel important. Um, a little more on topic, this guy, Giordano Bruno, is pretty famous for a lot of his pronouncements. Um, he asserted there are countless suns and countless Earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets in our system. We see only the suns because they are the largest bodies and are luminous, so he means the stars. But their planets remain invisible to us because they are smaller and non-luminous. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. So that first part is completely correct. Um, he, of course, had no way of knowing that, though. He was just making stuff up to cause trouble. He was a bit of a gadfly. That last bit there about how the other worlds are inhabited, well, we'd like to think so. We don't know if that's true. He certainly didn't know if that was true. And that particular thing is a heresy called the uh, plurality of worlds. He liked to annoy the Catholic Church, and for his troubles, he was burned at the stake in 1600. Fortunately, we're allowed to work on this stuff without that kind of... Um, those kinds of problems these days. But that first part, that the universe is filled with other suns that are being orbited by other planets, that's true. This has only recently been appreciated. The first person to figure this out was Penn State's own Alex Volstrom, uh, who's a professor here and found some planets orbiting a distant star called a pulsar. Um, when I started graduate school, we knew of about 20 planets orbiting other stars. And I actually, in, as a grad student, um, started a list of them all so I could keep track of them. And by the time I finished my PhD, I published my list of two or 300 planets. So just in my grad student career, we discovered hundreds of planets. Today, that number is about 20 times that size. And I actually gave up keeping track of them only a couple of years ago. Penn State undergrads were keeping track of it on a website that we maintained for a long time. So that first part, we do know that the planets are out there and that's really changed people's perceptions of the likelihood that we're going to find life elsewhere in the universe. First, we had to know if the other stars were really suns. Yes, they are. Then we had to know if they have planets. Yes, they do. Now the big question, are they inhabited? Do they have life? Maybe even life we could communicate with. And that last part, 
um, forms the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI. Now, um, uh, uh, one SETI researcher I know likes to say, we're not really searching for intelligence because you know, I, I can't look for brainwaves. But what we can look for is technology because the only way to make technology is with purposeful intelligence. And technology in principle could do something that could be detected across the universe. Um, and so the most obvious thing would be radio waves. We produce radio waves all the time with our radio stations, our radar, and sometimes we even send out deliberate signals to try and get attention of any aliens that might be out there. So radio waves are a really popular way to go looking. Um, but there are other things as well. Many different signatures of technology have been proposed. And so we call these techno signatures, signatures of technology. So SETI is also the search for techno signatures. So for instance, um, Earth's atmosphere is filled with what we call biosignatures. The oxygen on Earth's atmosphere is because of plants that respirate and they give off this oxygen. The carbon dioxide, well, that's also something that is made by life. We turn that oxygen into carbon dioxide. And the methane in our atmosphere is due to life. The, um, but some of the things in our atmosphere uh, are due to technology more than just life. So for instance, chlorofluorocarbons, those things that you know destroy the ozone layer, there's a lot of those in the atmosphere. Uh, and that's a techno signature. That proves that there's technology because there's no way to make those um, without technology. Life and other abiotic processes just do not make CFCs. Um, and then in principle, you know, you could find spacecraft and satellites. So if you put enough of those things around a star, that there's solar panels collecting the light, um, eventually, if you have enough of them, some of that light. Uh, enough of that light is getting blocked and enough of that energy is getting used that that could have detectable signatures on stars and you could tell that they exist and those are called Dyson spheres. So let's go through those just really briefly. These are just three. There are many other techno signatures that we can look for. Normally when I say the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, especially with radio, there's one image that comes to people's minds. I would pull you and see if you could guess what it is uh, if I could see you and do that, but I'll just show it to you. This is, I think, the most iconic image, Jodie Foster with the headphones at the Very Large Array from the film Contact, uh, based on a book written by Carl Sagan. Um, now, this character, uh, 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 Ellie Arroway, that Jodie Foster is playing, is based on a real SETI researcher. Her name is Jill Tarter. Um, and she really has spent her entire career uh, listening, so to speak, for radio waves from the stars. We don't really listen. We definitely don't use headphones. It's all done with computers. And we're not looking for FM radio. We're just looking for any kind of communicative signal. Um, this can be done at the Very Large Array, which is a real array here uh, that you see in Socorro, New Mexico. Um, the one that uh, we use here at Penn State is the 100 meter Green Bank Telescope. Um, this is also used by Professor Volstrom, who studies his pulsars, for instance. Um, this is much bigger than it looks. This is the largest thing that moves on land. And I have to say on land because, you know, those super tankers, like the one that got stuck in the Suez Canal a while back, those are a little bigger. And I guess they move because they float. Um, so if you don't count those, this is the largest thing on Earth that moves. Um, to give you a sense of scale, you could fit the football field in Beaver Stadium, the whole football field, inside of that dish. And that whole thing can tip up and down and rotate and point anywhere it likes on the sky. This is the most sensitive radio telescope that can do that in the world. Um, the other instrument that we would love to use, that Professor Volstrom used for decades, is the 300 meter Arecibo telescope. This is even bigger. You could fit all of Beaver Stadium inside of that dish right there. Um, sadly, you might have seen in the news that the cables failed and that centerpiece that's hanging above it crashed down into the dish and everything was destroyed. Um, this is just a huge loss for science, but just absolutely heartbreaking. There are some hopes that perhaps the National Science Foundation uh, will provide the money to rebuild it bigger and better. Uh, for a long time, it was the largest telescope in the world. Uh, and I think it can be um, the most productive and, and powerful radio telescope again. We'd love to continue using that. That is where most of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence has happened historically. So moving on, we can imagine those, um, those networks of satellites I talked about. Those are called Dyson spheres. If you Google Dyson spheres, you get some fantastic pictures. Um, these are very fanciful. I don't know exactly what we're supposed to be looking at here. These are artists' renditions of what it might look like. I don't know what that thing in the upper left is exactly supposed to be. 
Um, the upper right, you see they're deconstructing a planet to build this big sphere. This is not what they would look like. These are not physically possible. Um, but they give you a sense of the scale that we're talking about. If, if you give humanity enough time, give us a million years, give us 10 million, give us a billion years, um, eventually we're going to run out of um, non-renewable uh, um, energy here on Earth and we'll have to use pure renewable energy. And all renewable energy, almost, not nuclear, but everything else, uh, comes from the sun. It's ultimately sunlight. And so if you need more of it because you want more of whatever you're doing, you need to go out and get it. And it's great because the sun just lets all that energy fly off into space, right? It's just, it's just leaving the solar system. It's not doing anything any good. So you might as well go out and capture that and, uh, and do whatever it is that billion year old civilizations do. And if that happens, there are a few ways that we can tell. One is that um, when the stuff that's collecting the light passes in front of the star, the star will get dimmer. And that's actually how we find planets around other stars is when the planets do that. So if we saw something going in front of a star that didn't look like a planet, then that could be something like this. We can also look for the energy given off by all of that industry. One more way that we might find these things, these techno signatures, is to think about those planetary atmospheres. So when we find planets around other stars, we want to know what they're like. If those planets pass in front of their star, then we can actually study their atmospheres. Now, this is an artist's rendition. Again, we'd have no good pictures of exoplanets like this. But it, it does give you the sense that that starlight is filtering through the atmosphere. So normally we can measure the starlight and see what the star is made of. But when the planet goes in front, some of the starlight filters through, and then we can study how much of that light gets removed as the atmosphere moves in front of the star. And from that, we can determine the atmosphere's composition. And this has worked great so far. Big gas giant planets like Jupiter, we've discovered that they contain hydrogen and they contain methane and they contain uh, water, they contain carbon dioxide. Um, and so we can study their compositions. And in principle, if we found a planet like Earth with a thin atmosphere on a rocky planet that could be uh, habitable, we could even discover something like carbon, you know, CFCs or something like that. And actually, I used to think this was so far in the future it would never happen, but I just yesterday read a paper by a colleague um, that calculated it, and it's conceivable we can make a measurement like that in our own lifetimes. It's, it's within reach, which is just amazing. So there's so many ways to find all of these exoplanets. There's so much work to do, and it's so popular. Everyone knows about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the search for intelligent life in the universe. It's even the, the name of a Lily Tomlin play. Um, so you, you'd imagine a lot of searching has been done, but actually almost nothing has been done since the 1960s when this whole idea got started. And the reason is grandstanding politicians. In the late 80s, early 90s, um, it was very popular among certain politicians to pretend like they were cutting the deficit by finding funny sounding, relatively cheap programs and these you know, $100 billion budgets. They'd find something for like $2 million that sounded silly. And then they'd get into the Senate floor and brag about how they'd gotten it canceled. And the search for extraterrestrial intelligence was just easy pickings. They would brag about how they'd ended the Martian hunting at taxpayer expense and how all of those scientists haven't even bagged one of the little green guys yet. And it made for great television and, you know, their careers presumably did well, but the result was NASA and the NSF learned not to fund it. And when the government doesn't fund a field, no one gets trained in it and the field atrophies. So let me show you a picture from about three years ago uh, of a uh, conference at the SETI Institute. So without the government funding, we need private funding. Private donors stepped up where the government wouldn't and founded in California the SETI Institute. It's a nonprofit research institute. And it was going to carry on the work that NASA could no longer do. So three years ago, they had a big international conference for everyone who works on the problem. And here is the group photo of the conference. So a few things to know. For a big international meeting, a high profile field, normally you have to go outside and it's this gigantic picture. They all fit in this room, this little corner quite nicely. Um, so there's not very many of them. The second thing to note, most of these people do not work on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence full time. Most of the people here are hobbyists. They do it a little bit. They work on things tangential to it. A few exceptions down there in the lower left, that's Jill Tarter 
who did work on it her whole career, the inspiration for contact immediately to her right, Sophia Sheikh. We'll talk about her more in just a little bit. The last thing to notice about this is just the demographics of this room. It's a lot of older folks because no one's being trained because there's no money in it. The, um, the, 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 the field started strong with people like right there in the middle, Frank Drake, for instance, who started the whole thing and did the first search. Um, but since then, without money, uh, not a lot of young people have been involved. Um, uh, Jill Tarter there on the lower left, she likes to say if you took all of the people who work full time on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you could fit them all in a phone booth. And if you're, you're creative about how you fill phone booths, that's basically correct. But things might be starting to change. Congress no longer thinks it's great to cut this kind of thing. They've started asking NASA, why don't you work on this? Everybody thinks it's interesting. The discovery of all those exoplanets, now we're out looking for life on them. We're looking for life on Mars. Why will we look for microbial life, little slime or hints of fossils on Mars, but not look for intelligent life that we might be able to talk to around other systems? And so that that has really sort of changed the mindset and NASA has been scrambling in the last three years to figure out how it can get back in this game, which is really nice. So NASA held a workshop just a few months after the one I just showed you uh, to try and figure out what it could do. And they asked me to organize it and put together the science program so that we could find experts that could tell NASA how it could work on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So here is the group photo. This is a very different group photo. Again, almost no one here is full time, but it's a much bigger group. Uh, it's a much younger group. And everyone's really excited that things are moving forward and that NASA is getting, um, getting back involved. So this is exactly the right time for us to start moving into the field and growing it again. And that is the premise behind the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center. So when we put this idea together, we wanted to get you know, outside validation and luminaries that would say, this is something that really needs to happen. We put together an advisory board uh, and it's great. We have there at the top, the former chair of the SETI Institute. Of course, we have Professor Volstron who found the first exoplanets. Uh, we have George Smoot, a Nobel laureate in physics. We have Frank Drake himself, who started the whole field in 1959. President Barron, David Brin, who's a sci-fi author you might have heard of, um, and uh, former Dean Kavanagh, and many others. Um, it's just really exciting to see so many people say, this is what we need to do. And Penn State is the right place to do it. We have the highest sighted astronomy faculty in the world. We are one of the largest departments, we're not the largest. Um, but uh, in terms of how many citations, how many times other researchers cite our faculty's papers, our faculty are rated uh, number one or very near number one in the world. We're the only department that has multiple editors of the journals of the American Astronomical Society. There are not very many and we have two. We have the largest number of astronomy students in the country, perhaps the world. I don't, I don't know the statistics for big universities in China and India, for instance, but I suspect it's actually the world. Don might, might know. Um, we're the hub for no, multiple NASA missions, in particular the SWIFT Observatory, which scans the skies for all sorts of things in gamma rays and X-rays and ultraviolet radiation. Um, and we have an astrobiology PhD program. Now, this is almost unique. There's only one more of these in the world. It's at the University of Washington. Astrobiology is the study of life's origins and development and distribution everywhere in the universe. So it's how life started on Earth. It's how life evolved on Earth. It's how life might have evolved elsewhere, like on Mars. And it's even how life might have become intelligent and done uh, technology. For over 10 years now, Penn State has been one of the world leaders, if not the world leader in this field. Um, you see there um, uh, some Penn State graduate students as part of their astrobiology dual title PhD program, doing real experiments in caves and studying the life there in the way that we hope we might be able to look for life on other planets in the future. So what is a dual title program? It means that biologists or chemists or geomicrobiologists or geophysicists or astronomers or planetary scientists 
students that come here to get a PhD in that field and become a professional in any of those things can simultaneously get their PhD as astrobiologists. And to do that, they have to get out of their own little department and their very narrow esoteric work. And they have to go to the astronomy department and they have to learn about other planets and they have to go over to the geophysics department and learn about how planets evolved and how life began. Um, so it's a truly interdisciplinary uh, degree and it's one that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is now a part of. So to try and leverage all of this stuff going on, because it's in all of these different units, we've got, we've got people in engineering that are building helicopters that will fly on Saturn's moon Titan. We have um, all of these geomicrobiologists working on the origin of life in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. We have people studying new planets in the Department of Astronomy um, to, to try and get us all working together and knowing about what we're doing. We've created a new consortium called the Consortium for Planetary and Exoplanetary Sciences and Technology. We're trying to get planets, exoplanets, life, science, technology, put it all together so that we can all work together on these projects. And this consortium has four pieces. There's the long-standing Penn State Astrobiology Research Center, which we've had, as I've said, for over 10 years, that manages the dual title PhD program. We also have uh, the long-standing Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds, which was founded by Professor Volschar, and which studies exoplanets, uh, all those exoplanets, those thousands of exoplanets that we're now, uh, we now know about all throughout the universe. Now, as of last year, the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center is part of this consortium, and soon we will have a Center for Planetary System Science, which will be dedicated to studying the planets in our solar system and whether there might be life on them. So I'm really excited about this uh, because we're finally going to get all of the pieces of the puzzle under one umbrella and we can all work together to solve these problems. So getting back to the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center and what we are doing is our part. To me, the most important thing we do is actually not searching. It's actually training people who are going to search because there's a lot of ideas. I gave three of those ideas for how we might find life in the universe. If I had to bet on which one would work, I would bet none of them. Not because I don't think we'll find life, but because I think the right way to find it, we probably haven't thought of yet. Because as I've said, when it's just a few people working on it, you know you haven't had all of the ideas. We've got some brilliant students coming up that I think are going to be really creative, and one of them is going to strike on the right techno signature that we need to be looking for. So to do that, I've uh, initiated a new graduate course uh, that's part of the dual title astrobiology program. And so we've got students coming from all over the university. Uh, and it's, uh, we taught it for the first time in 2018. And we taught SETI. We taught all of the problem, all of the techno signatures, all of the ways that we can do this. We, uh, I also challenged them all. I said, this is a very young field. For your final project, you have to do something new that no one's ever done before. And you have to try and get it published. And they did. They came up with new projects. And many of them got those pub, um, published in peer-reviewed journals and made real impacts on the field. In addition, as an entire group, we went to the Green Bank Telescope to conduct novel SETI observations of the student's design. So here, is the, the, here are the pictures. The one on top looks a lot better. It was at the visitor center with a proper camera with that gigantic telescope in the background. Again, it's much farther away than it looks. The bottom one is all fuzzy because it was taken with a film camera, a disposable film camera because no electronics are allowed near the telescope. Um, if you bring your phone near that telescope, all your teles that telescope will be able to detect is your phone. In fact, that telescope can detect your phone if it's on Mars. That's how sensitive it is. So we, uh, we had to use a little disposable camera for that. But you can see how thrilled the students are to get to go to this place in person and look for life in the universe. Um, the course is now on the books. We taught it again last fall, of course, uh, it's COVID times, and so we don't have these happy pictures of us all standing next to each other. Um, so we had to do our observations remotely. So here is the Zoom session where part of the class, it was a big class, part of the class uh, was actually driving that big telescope, and you can there see the, the control panel uh, that we were using as we steered that big telescope around uh, and did even more novel SETI investigations. And I have a student working this summer on turning those measurements uh, into a paper and we'll see if we found anything. And I'm pleased to announce, this is new news, that uh, this fall we will be offering an undergraduate course for our seniors. 
So our, this will be pitched mostly at astronomy students who are finishing up their BA in, in astronomy and astrophysics or planetary science and astronomy. And, uh, and they'll be learning basically the same thing as the graduate students, but at an undergraduate level. And this is great because then they're going to go off to do whatever they do, whether it's an industry, whether they go on to academia, but they're going to carry with them an understanding of what SETI is and understand how they can contribute to it. So I'm really excited about all of that. Um, the thing that really got us kicked off, though, um, was actually some alumni. This is something that we've been trying to do, something we've wanted to get going. We thought it would be a good idea. We had the advisory uh, committee, but I need to acknowledge uh, John and Natalie Patton, uh, who really got us started uh, back in 2019 uh, for the center itself when they made a, uh, a promise of a future gift of two and a half million dollars to endow the center. Uh, that's what really convinced us that, you know, this had legs. This is something that uh, that we should be doing. And it also really inspired people everywhere. People took notice of this and how Penn State was now poised to be the hub, the leader in this field in the whole world. Um, Science Magazine ran a article uh, about our new center and what we're going to be doing there. The New Yorker profiled me and the center uh, in this really cool article uh, about all the new ways that we're going to go about trying to find life in the universe. Scientific American was really proud, um, uh, was really happy to learn that we were going to have the graduate program. And so the graduate program got a whole write up in that magazine. Uh, and our own Sophia Sheikh, who was in that earlier um, uh, picture sitting next to Jill Tarter that I mentioned, uh, she was profiled in Science Magazine uh, as, uh, as an up and coming researcher uh, in the field as it's growing again. And it's, it's once again um, um, uh, coming to life. So my own entree into this field uh, came rather late. Like I said, I'm not formally trained in it, hardly anyone is. Um, but I got into it when I started looking on little projects connected to looking for planets, because that's my bread and butter research, looking for planets. So um, I said that when a planet passes in front of a star, the star can get dimmer, and that's how we find them. But that if a Dyson sphere were around the star, that that might have a different signature and that we might notice it. So I was thinking about this. I was writing a paper about this. And a colleague showed me some data from a star. And she said, I don't know what's in front of the star. Something's orbiting this star, but it's definitely not a planet. And she showed it to me. And I said, oh my gosh, like that's what we're looking for. We should go study it and point the Green Bank Telescope at it and see if maybe it's a Dyson sphere. So um, this, this whole discussion we were having got written up in the Atlantic. It, um, it got a lot of views and became very um, uh, popular. Um, so my colleague, uh, Tabby Boyajian, her idea was that there were gigantic comets, like the size of Pluto, huge comets orbiting the star, blocking the starlight. And I proposed modestly, well, we should consider that maybe it's a Dyson sphere and we should look for that. So that got into the Atlantic article. People love to hear about aliens. It became very, you know, just like the person sitting next to me on the plane says, oh, that sounds great. Even though all we had was an idea, even though we hadn't really found anything yet, it kind of got away from us. It was very strange. I saw it was on Saturday Night Live weekend update. They talked about how we found aliens. Uh, Stephen Colbert got extremely excited. He said we had discovered the ring world and, um, and Neil deGrasse Tyson had to talk him down and explain that that's probably, it was probably just comets. And so uh, that was, that was a, a sort of a lesson for me in how to contain this work and, and think about how the media responds to it. It was definitely, uh, definitely very strange. But we eventually studied that object. We established that Tabby's probably right. It probably is comets. It's definitely not a Dyson sphere. Um, and so that's been really neat to find such an amazing object and figure out what it is. Um, and since then, I've been continuing to badger NASA, like to follow up on that workshop, like let's get going, let's get some funding to do this research. And indeed, um, last year uh, we were, uh, I was part of a team that proposed and successfully got some money from NASA to uh, look for signs of alien technology. In fact, it's this team that established that chlorofluorocarbon CFCs are something we might be able to detect in our lifetime, which was a really cool result that I'm looking forward to. So let me tell you about the students, because like I said, if this is gonna work, it's gonna be because of our amazing students. Uh, so this is Sophia Sheikh. She um, will be defending her PhD on June 2nd. Her work, uh, she's done way too many things for me to list, so I'll just 
mention one, um, there's an enormous project uh, funded by a billionaire in California named Yuri Milner uh, to do radio SETI in the style of Contact and Jodie Foster and all of that. Uh, and Sophia is on that team and is one of the leaders of that team. And in fact, they recently did a huge data release of, of years and years of data that they had collected. Uh, and Sophia uh, was featured as one of the leaders of that effort to make those data public. Um, Shubham Kanodia is another student uh, that I work with on various projects. He, uh, in that SETI course that we taught, his final project was just to calculate how much searching we had already done. Because I kept saying, we've barely looked. And he was like, well, let's quantify that. What do you mean you've barely looked? How much searching have we done? And so we, um, he and another student in the class uh, worked it out. I said, this is great. Let's publish it. We published it. The economists thought that that was very cool. Um, and so that made a neat splash. I have two other students in the, the Peace Study Center, Macy Houston, uh, who's a third year student. Uh, she's helping me look for Dyson spheres. And in fact, I just yesterday saw her latest results on how detectable they would be in various ways. It's the first time that anyone's ever actually calculated what you would need to look for rigorously. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to getting that paper out this summer. And we have a brand new student, Nick Toussaint, whom because of COVID I've never actually met in person, um, but has uh, decided he wants to work with what's the largest radio telescope array in the world. It's in South Africa. It's gonna be the most powerful and sensitive SETI instrument ever when it's fully online. Uh, and he is part of the team that's gonna make that work. And so he's been calculating how many stars they can look for and things like that. Um, he's also going to be the one um, analyzing the data that we took as part of the SETI course. So it's great to do this work at Penn State because Penn State has so many resources that we can use. One that we need to use more and get these students involved in now that we're going are, um, is the Institute for Computational and Data Science. Penn State has a supercomputer right on campus with enormous amounts of storage, enormous amounts of computing power. And we need to leverage that because the amount of data that comes out of these telescopes is measured in petabytes. It's just enormous amounts of data and there's just no way we can look through it all. And so we need to leverage this. And I'm really looking forward to um, integrating SETI with um, the ICDS activities. The other thing that we can do at Penn State that no one else can do is we can think way, way outside the box because there are so many things we could be looking for that we're not. So Penn State is uh, the hub of a network called AMON, the, Astron the Astronomy Multi-Messenger Observatory Network. This is a network of observatories that detect all, all four fundamental forces of nature that are carried, we say, through space to send messages to us. So not messages as in, you know, aliens trying to tell us something, but just informing us about the universe. So starlight tells us about stars. That's kind of a message. So we can look for light from photons. Um, we're very good at that as astronomers, but we can also look for gravitational waves. Who knows how aliens might be communicating or what they might be doing that could generate gravitational waves. We can look for neutrinos. Um, which are these ghostly particles that have, we don't really understand them very well, but we now for the first time have observatories that can detect them all over the world. And we can look for cosmic rays. Penn State is a big partner in New Jay Observatory in, in, um, in Chile that detects these particles. And so we don't know what aliens are gonna do to get our attention or what they're gonna do that we could notice even if they're not trying to get our attention. But I do know that Penn State is the place that has all the bases covered so that we can get creative and start looking for anything. So to really be a hub, um, we, we, we need to bring the world community together. We need to develop the world community and, and create it and send our students out and bring people in and collaborate and make sure that we're you know, using all of the pieces that we have. And so the idea was that two years ago, uh, we were going to hold a symposium at Penn State um, and it was gonna be the premier SETI um, uh, uh, conference. It would be like the one NASA held, but instead of just telling NASA what it should be doing, we'd be working together to think of new things, present our results, train our students, and really get that, that global community together. Of course, COVID struck, so we had to postpone it. COVID kept going, we had to postpone it again. So I'm getting very, very impatient. However, we're hopeful that this June, it is scheduled. I'm sorry, not this June, it's supposed to be this June. 
next June, <laughs> it is scheduled, next June, uh, in 2022, uh, we will finally host the symposium. We will finally get everybody uh, together in one place and uh, we will finally have this big in-person conference. And I, I, I know um, anticipation for this is really high. My colleagues in SETI around the world are really eager to go to this. And, um, and uh, I, I really think it'll mark the beginning of the new era of SETI and it's, um, it's, it's the global collaboration. So the center is really unique in academia. Only eight people have ever gotten a PhD about SETI. I mean, there are people in like the social sciences who study, you know, what people think about SETI and stuff. But in terms of people actually looking, like actually doing the work, eight people in 60 years have ever gotten a PhD uh, in the field. Sophia on June 2nd will become the ninth. No university has more than one person working more than half time on this project. It's still very small. So uh, I'm, I'm working more than 50% on this here. We're hopeful that we can grow in the future and get more faculty working on it. Um, only one other university in the world offers a graduate course uh, in SETI, which is at UCLA, and it's focused on radio SETI, and they produce a lot of students as well. So we're, we're practically, you know, there's one other course, and our course is broader than just radio SETI. So the, the PSETI Center, we're going to train the next generation. We're going to incubate new strategies and technologies, stuff I haven't even thought of yet. These students are really creative. We're going to support and foster that worldwide community with the symposium. Um, we're going to look beyond just the radio and the laser. And we're, going to, we're going to think about neutrinos and gravitational waves. And we're going to find lots of stuff. With that example of that star I worked on with Tabby Boyajian, we found an amazing star and it's really interesting and we're still studying it, trying to figure out what it is. It's okay that it's not a Dyson sphere. Whatever it is is strange enough um, that it deserves study. So if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing, I'm happy to answer lots of questions. A couple more resources for you first. Um, your January, February issue of the Penn Stater has an article about this uh, called Leading the Search for ET, which I think came out really well. And um, there's also a website you can go, just search for PSETI Penn State and you'll find our website. There's a, um, uh, there's one side that kind of describes what we do. There's a great video there. It's narrated by Jonathan Frakes, who is a Penn State uh, alumnus. He was uh, Commander Riker on Star Trek. Um, and uh, it uh, also, I got to meet Frank Drake when we were making this, the guy who started this entire field. Uh, and he let us film at his house. It was really cool. I just watch the video. It's just really inspiring. Um, we also have a research page uh, where you can keep up with all of the research that we're doing as stories come out about the research that we publish. We will post them there. And you can also find all of the articles I mentioned earlier uh, listed under the media section on that website. And so with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Hey, thank you very much, Jason. If you have questions, again, please uh, type them into the question and answer box. Um, question, will the slides be available to us? I'm happy to make these slides available, yeah. Um, I don't know the answer of how we will get them to you, but I'm sure we'll figure that out. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Um, what uh, impact will James Webb Telescope have on mm. the um, yeah. field? So, um, so NASA has, for the past decade, um, been building a gigantic successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, which is getting very old and is really on its last legs, its last gyros, actually. Um, it will be, it'll be great. And I've been struggling to think exactly like, you know, what, what, what can I do with SETI with it? because it's gonna be very hard to get time on that telescope. Um, and uh, I have a lot of ideas, but I'm not sure what we can do right away. But this new paper that we just came out with shows that the James Webb Space Telescope will be sensitive to very large amounts of chlorofluorocarbons, for instance, in planetary atmospheres. And so what this means is when we are studying those other exoplanets to look for biosignatures, which is definitely something it will do, we can use those very same data that, um, that we're collecting to look for methane and oxygen and all of those things, to look for things like CFCs. Now they would need a lot of them for us to detect it, but who knows if they don't have ozone, then maybe they're perfectly happy to put tons of CFCs into the atmosphere because there's no problem with them. Um, except for the ozone thing, they're actually mostly harmless. 
Um, they, they also do some greenhouse warming. Anyway, um, so I think that's the most immediate thing that we can do with the James Webb Space Telescope. Secondarily, when we find Dyson sphere candidates, um, there are a lot of thing, other things that those could be, like giant comets and things. The James Webb Tele Space Telescope is going to be great at diagnosing that and seeing what's really going on. And so we asked to point it at Tabby Star to see if we could find those comets and figure out exactly what's going on. Like I said, time is extremely competitive. Only like 25% of proposals were accepted. We were just below the line, but I think next cycle will probably get the time. Okay, does P. SETI have any upcoming postdoc positions? Ah, uh, that depends a lot on NASA and the National Science Foundation. <laughs> so um, we are continually asking them for funds. And in fact, um, I'm expecting any day now to hear back from the National Science Foundation about my proposal to hire a postdoc. So if the National Science Foundation or NASA approves one of our proposals, then we will definitely be hiring someone. Um, or if we were to get an endowment or something like that, that would let us hire someone. And then we, we'd be able to do a lot of searching if we had someone. At the moment though, uh, it's just me and the four uh, graduate students I mentioned. Three really, because one of them is mostly doing something else. Okay, a question I'm looking forward to the answer to is, what happens if you find someone out there? Oh, what happens? It depends a lot on what it is we find. <laughs> so if what we find is something like a Dyson sphere, then we get to study it. And that'll be really neat, figuring out what kind of technology is it? How, how big is the technology? How much energy is the technology using? We'll also try to look for other things. Are there stray radio signals that we can detect? Maybe stray laser signals? Can we find the planets in the system? I mean, we'll study it so thoroughly once we know it's interesting. If on the other hand, what we detect is like a radio signal with like content, a message of some kind, like in the film Contact, that's very different because all of a sudden we have questions, right? We have, can we decipher it? What does it say? Should we respond? And those are profound questions. So it'll depend a lot, again, on where it came from and whether we can understand it. But um, there do exist protocols, post-detection protocols, they're called, and what we're supposed to do when such a signal happens. Um, they are based on radical transparency. Like as soon as you're sure it's real, it's been confirmed by another observatory, you tell everybody where it is, you contact international organizations, you organize the world scientists to start studying it. You definitely don't respond. That has to be a global decision and so on. So those protocols have been around for a while. They're kind of outdated. They need to be updated. In fact, I am in the final drafts right now of a paper for space policy that I'm writing with a, a space lawyer at high levels in the State Department and a philosopher who works in problems of ethics and astrobiology. And we're writing a paper on our recommendations for what those post detection protocols should look like. Okay, um, what's your top priority if, um, for funding? Um, um, it's, definitely to fund, it's definitely to fund the, um, the students and the postdocs. Like I would love to be able to, um, I mean, just being able to fund a student over a summer, because in the summer they, they generally aren't TAs. And so it's my responsibility to keep them funded. Um, an endowment to fund those great students we have over their summers, even better over their years, and then and then have a postdoc that can work on this stuff would be great. I would also love to endow the symposium. The symposium is gonna be such an amazing advertisement for the Pisetti Center. I really think it will be the place to announce new results, show new ideas, because um, um, most fields have a premier conference every year or every two years where the whole world gets together with their best newest stuff. And Penn State can be the place to do that. Um, but it's, you know, it's not cheap. We have to pay for people to come and we have to run a whole conference. So I think those are my top three right now. Okay. Is there an information center or tour available about the SETI program if people visit in person? Can yeah, they so the just website, drop by and talk, chat with you about this? Right. So definitely in COVID times, the website's where to go. And that's where we put everything up. Gosh, I haven't seen my office in so long. I don't know how to answer that. But yes, I think um, if you were to come by campus, um, you could definitely meet the people involved. We don't have a physical location for the center yet. There's not like a visitor center or its own building or anything like that. Um, but, um, uh, but you could definitely uh, talk to the people involved. And you could see where we work and all of the, uh, the connections we're making across the university. Okay. 
Do you know if the Chinese uh, FAST telescope is doing any SETI research? It is, in fact. Um, one of the neat things was that, so FAST is the 500 meter radio telescope. So big, almost twice the size of Arecibo <laughs> um, that's been built uh, in the mountains in China. And uh, it will be a lot like Arecibo, but more sensitive in many ways. And when they were talking about the science case, they actually said the search for extraterrestrial intelligence was one of the things they were going to work on, which is just great because normally when you build these telescopes, it's like an afterthought. Um, the uh, people at UC Berkeley, who like, like, like the people you saw in that, in that picture at the SETI Institute, the people that have been doing this their whole lives, they've been working closely with the scientists at FAST to develop those technologies and turn it into a SETI uh, a SETI machine. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the results they get. It's not quite done yet. I think they've started to make observations, but it's not at full capabilities yet. But it'll be a powerful SETI tool for sure. Okay, I have a request for the direct link to the uh, video on the website. Elaine. Ah, okay, and, sure. Uh, yes. Uh, well, maybe, uh, Elaine maybe. And, and Jen can take care of that, Jason. They oh, that's can, probably true. They can give a direct link. Okay. They, they can give a direct link. So if you could do that. Sure. Yeah, How there are two sides to that website. There's the research side and there's the support side. And it's on the support side, right, that is a Vimeo embedded. How do you choose what parts of the sky to observe? That's really, that's really difficult. Um, so there's two approaches. One is you can just look at everything and look for the things that feel most likely. And so when we, for instance, we're looking for Dyson spheres, we look at the whole sky and see which stars are most likely to have them. But you can only do that if someone has surveyed the entire sky at the appropriate wavelengths. And the sky has not been surveyed at the appropriate wavelengths, at, you know, um, or at many of the appropriate wavelengths. So the other thing is that if you're pointing those radio telescopes, you can't look everywhere because they have these little pencil beam fields of view. You have to pick which stars to look at. So this is one thing that Nick Toussaint, our new student, is working on. How do you choose which stars to look at? The usual scheme is you look at stars like the sun because the sun is the one case we know of a star that managed to give birth to technology, us. So for lack of any better place to look, you might as well look at places like the sun. There's also places that probably aren't great, very young stars, very bright stars. There hasn't been enough time for, for life to form. Uh, and so those maybe aren't so great, but we also try to keep an open mind. So, those radio searches spend a good chunk of their time looking at stars like the sun, but then they also save some of their time to look at just everything, every kind of star, every kind of phenomena, especially the weird ones. Because who knows, maybe what we think is just a very strange star is actually a Dyson sphere or something, but it's a, it's a hard problem. Okay, here is a fundamental question for you. Other than being cool and interesting, what is the value we might get from this research? Mm, yes. Well, people have been wondering if we're alone for a long time. It's an old question. I think the ultimate value in this research, I mean, this isn't like curing cancer, right? This is fundamental research. It's answering fundamental questions. It's not applied. But I think everyone on earth can appreciate finally getting an answer to this. And so I think public interest is a, is a useful metric of how interesting and useful your research is. And so I'm not sure there will be many spin-off technologies that are practical to people's everyday lives. I think most of the discovery we will make will be really interesting to astronomers. Finding that star with the weird comets around it, that's super interesting. We're gonna find a ton of things like that when we're looking for life. But if we succeed, um, I, I just think that philosophical implications are so profound. It will be like the discovery of planets around other stars, but much more important. Okay. Um, what sources of funding can PSETI um, tap into? At the yeah. Moment? And in the so, near future. In the near future. Um, so the most obvious ones are NASA and the National Science Foundation. They are both allowed now to fund this research. And so um, we are applying and I showed one of the grants. That, that's the biggest one. Um, private philanthropy historically has been where most SETI research has come from. So the SETI Institute was founded by Barney Oliver, who was one of the founders of Hewlett Packard. The Allen Telescope Array, um, which they used to do their searching was funded by Paul Allen. 
And right now, the biggest program in the world is called Break to Listen, and it's being funded uh, by a billionaire named Yuri Miller. So um, those are the main avenues. We also, we got, for instance, a little bit of money from the Templeton Foundation. They, they supported my very first SETI project, for instance. Um, but my real hope is that Penn State itself would have an endowment so that we didn't have to constantly be applying for money and that we could use that endowment to just do the work. And that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, how do you handle the time delay uh, communications? Um, you really haven't addressed that in your talk. No, um, I didn't mention so it at all. Oh, that's a good point. So let's imagine that um, the, the, the radio telescopes found a signal from Proxima. So Proxima is the very closest star to Earth. And in fact, um, you might have seen in the news a while ago, the, the, one of the radio telescopes that the Breakthrough Listen Project was using saw a candidate signal coming from Proxima. And that signal is right now being analyzed, in fact, by our own Sophia Sheikh, who's leading the Nature article on the analysis of that signal, which is very cool. It's radio frequency interference, I'm almost positive. It's not an alien signal, um, but it's, it's incredible. So let's say that signal were real, and then it's not radio frequency interference from Earth. In that case, the signal we're receiving left that star four years ago. So if it were an invitation to communicate, right, it's like, you know, press one to talk to our Supreme Commander or whatever it says, um, then we would respond, maybe. If we did, then eight years later, we could get the response back. So this is a very high latency communication if it happens at all. Most of the stars we look at are more like 200 light years away. So in that case, we're not gonna be having two way conversations except over generational timescales. So whether we respond or not, isn't just a question of what's gonna happen. It's what's gonna to happen to our distant descendants. You know, what, what message are they gonna get back if we respond and that sort of thing. So I actually don't worry too much about communication. It's very unlikely, I think, that we're gonna be establishing communication. And if it's thousands of light years away, yeah, then there's basically no communication at all. The only difference would be if there were something in the solar system that we could communicate with. Like in 2001, there was the monolith. If it were that close, then we could actually establish communication. I have a couple of questions and comments about crowdsourcing the research. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we we had a lot of luck with this with Tabby Stall. So when that article came out and it was on Saturday Night Live that we were studying this thing, someone suggested to us that we crowdsource the research to figure out what it was. So we did a Kickstarter and uh, we raised $100,000, which was enough to buy time on a private telescope network to monitor the star and study it. And it worked. After a little more than a year, we saw the star um, like it dim again because whatever it was was passing in front. We analyzed the light that went through whatever was passing in front. Uh, and we were able to show that it was not solid material, that it looked a lot like comet dust and stuff like that. So crowdsourcing can work really well when there's a particular project we really want to do and it has a, a really high public profile. The other way to crowdsource this research is through citizen science. So for instance, uh, we have a proposal in right now to the National Science Foundation um, to help us look through all of the data to look for Dyson Sphere candidates. So there's this all sky survey that was very good at finding the things, but there's like a hundred million sources and we just can't look through them all. I'd love to use the supercomputer for that, but it's actually faster to invite people from all over the world to just look at it with their eyes. And so we actually want to create a crowdsourced research project to look at all of the sources and filter out all of the bad data so that we can just focus on the things that might be Dyson spheres. Okay, um, a couple questions on a similar topic. Um, is it useful for us to send out any signals to targets? And is it wise to send out <laughs> signals? to other targets yeah. so to advertise called, our position. Right, this is called messaging extraterrestrial intelligence or METI. And there are a few places uh, that do this. Every few years, they'll send a signal out to some nearby star in hopes of getting a response. Um, it's not something that we're planning to do at Penn State. It's obviously controversial. Some people are worried that if we let them know we're here, they'll, I don't know, come eat us or something like that. Um, remember though, that Earth has biosignatures and technosignatures, whether we send them out or not. So if there really is a, you know, powerful alien species that can cross the stars or whatnot, 
they almost certainly already know the earth is here. They already know that the earth has ozone and methane and oxygen and all those things I mentioned. And they can probably tell that we have aircraft radar and that we send radar to measure, you know, asteroids and things like that. We're constantly announcing our presence. So my suspicion is it doesn't really matter if we send signals out or not, because we're already sending signals out. Um, once you choose a part of the sky to observe, how long you do, do you observe it and how long would it take to cover the entire sky? Yeah, it depends on what we're doing. So when we look with the radio telescope, you know, we have to hope that there's a signal that's arriving at Earth right when we're looking. And um, so that involves staring at that thing for long enough to get a good measurement and then we'll move on to the next star. So a typical cadence is that we will look at the star for about five minutes, and then to calibrate the instrument and make sure it's not from Earth, we'll look away for five minutes. And if the signal is still there when we look away for five minutes, then that means it's not from the star, it's from whatever, it's from someone's cell phone. Um, and so we'll go back and forth three times. So we'll spend about 30 minutes on a target, and about 15 of those are actually staring directly at it. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Um, looks like we're timed it very nicely. Very well, nice. Thank yes. you very much, Jason. Um, as, the head, as the head of the department, I'm very excited by this development that has happened over the few years, and I hope you've enjoyed our presentation. And once COVID um, declines, please feel welcome to stop by and uh, visit the people in the astro astronomy department. Good afternoon. Have a good day.